five ways you can be a financial superhero. It's Brian Preston, the money guy. So, okay, is, is, is Robin a superhero? Because I oh. feel like he's just... He's a boy wonder. He's just, he's not that super. But look, we're a duo. I just... We're a duo, so I'm Batman. You're Robin the Boy Wonder. No, see, I don't... You just happen is, to be getting bench press more. This is what happens when I'm not involved in show prep, because this should totally be <laughs> Superman, or maybe Captain America, or... I don't... Just somebody, not Robin? You... you, you it looks great, Bo. So here's the thing. Here's what I want to talk to you guys about. This is one I've been so excited about, so much so that we bought props. <laughs> Obviously without Bo's input, as you can see, because he ended up as Robin. And by the way, that's Robin. not the Robin I would have picked out. I would have picked out one that almost had you wearing the thing, and then you could have said, oh, holy like, like, mackerel, like, Batman, like, or something, like, you know. But it, it is you ended up with the respectable R for Robin the Boy Wonder. But, I don't feel very But here's what I want you guys to know. I recognize if you're good with money, first of all, you're watching a financial show or you're listening to a financial podcast, you already think about money differently than the majority of the country. That's right. So because of that, you probably notice you feel a little different. You have some some special skills. You, you're like, how does everybody else not know this? But realize there's a whole industry that's teaching you to be a consumer. That's right. There's people trying to sell you things at every angle. Somehow you're immune to it all. We had a listener, and Bo, you might even know who it is, and they might even be listening, that wrote us. I mean, this is probably going on five or six years ago. And they wrote an email and said, you guys get me. I feel like oh, I'm yeah, a financial yeah, yeah. mutant, yep. and you guys are coming. You're, you're cut from the same cloth. You have the same deformity that you see through all the mess, the noise that everybody's dealing with. I like you guys. And that made me start thinking. That put me on this path towards financial mutant, financial superhero. All of us have, if you're good with money, you have some superpower that we think it's worthwhile to kind of walk through what these five main superpowers are that we think you can harness and it helps you set yourself aside to be really good with your money. Yeah, I think one of the things that's interesting is not only do we get to walk the walk of a lot of these, but Brian, in what we do for our day job every single day, being family financial advisors, we actually get to work side by side with these superheroes. So we are gonna actually you tell you some of the stuff that we've recognized and their skill sets on how they've become a financial superhero. So I want to hit this really quick because I think there's a lot to be learned and a lot to be celebrated. By the way, if you're somebody who's young and you feel like you have some of these special skills, we understand that if you're a financial mutant or a financial superhero, you got to develop some of these things. you got to right. practice. You're not going to get good at this unless you understand what you're dealing with. So pay attention to make sure you are honing in these skills we're about to cover. So number one, you're a master of disguise. Uh, yeah, I think the good most superheroes. I feel like you don't know that they're they're. You only know the persona. You don't actually know the person behind. It's sort of a secret about what their real identity is, right? They have a cover identity. So if you think about it, like you probably right now wish you were Clark Kent. I could. That is a hundred percent accurate <laughs> statement right now. I don't I even am, know what Robin's cover identity is. I'm He's just the boy Chris wonder. Chris O'Donnell is who I am right now. <laughs> so, so, but it is one of the, the truth of the matter is, if you're a master of disguise, most people who are really good with money, why do you think? Let's let's cover some of the books that I love mm -hmm. giving stats from, The Millionaire Next Door. Uh, yep. And then Dr. Stanley's daughter, The Next Millionaire Next Door. Mm -hmm. And then of course you have Chris Hogan's Everyday Millionaires. All of these books have in common is that there is a whole group of super successful people that are this stealth wealth. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't even know that they lived next That's door right. to you because they don't show off their wealth. What we talk about it all the time, Brian, is we actually think that wealth isn't something you can actually see. When we see folks who have really uh, nice cars and expensive clothes and nice toys and big houses, it's uh, actually a bigger sign of how they spend money less exactly. than how they accumulate and build wealth. I mean, there's all, and look, if you haven't read any of those books, go through them. And, and by the way, we have another one by Dr. Stanley, Stop Acting Rich, which goes through what type of shoes, you know, what's the most they ever spent mm -hmm. on clothing and other things, because you will be shocked. I think that the consumer side of the business, meaning all the advertisers and everybody else, wants you to think lifestyles of the rich and famous. The reality is much more boring. That's right. And why is that the case? Probably a married couple with a few kids that lives in a very modest home 
let's face it, it's not too sensational. It's not too exciting. Right. They'd much rather show you some, you know, 50 year old guy or even 35 year old guy that's got a 200 foot yacht that's right. and, you know, people dancing around on it. So it's, it's just that's what's sensational. So they don't sell that. Um, but here's the other thing I thought was interesting. We pulled the data. Now, y'all know most millionaires are first generation. Right. 80% according to the millionaire next door, 86% according to the next millionaire next door. And then Chris Hogan is right around 79%, I believe, with Meaning everyday they did, they millionaires. They did inherit it. It wasn't passed down. All they first generation. Well, here's a up. new stat because there's another book out there called The New Elite, which has it looks at people that have net worths that are five to $10 million in the, of liquid assets. And then, or $380,000 of annual income. That's what they consider this new elite. I don't love elite. When I see elite, right. that means like it's you make putting it people down. Almost, but right? I, don't, I don't think that's the case for most millionaire next doors. But here's what they found. And we have a stat for this is that 80% of people who have $5 million or greater, their friends and family are completely clueless, meaning they are undercover. Yeah, I think it's it's this whole contrarian idea because if you think about folks who really could flex, if you've got $5 million built up, you're in that unique echelon where you could buy nice houses and nice cars and fill in the blank, but 80% of those folks who actually fall into that category fly under the radar. By the way, I have to give a shout out because I think you'll get a kick out of it. I have used the term around Daniel of decamillionaire, talking uh -huh. about people who have 10 million. So, and I knew when Carol came up to us and pre show, she goes, Y'all make that word up. <laughs> this is a Daniel exclusive. This penta millionaires is Daniel put this in the so slide. I love it. You mean to tell me we've emboldened intern Daniel so much now that he's making up words? I don't know to if you can go notes. to Webster and look up penta millionaire, but I love <laughs> it. So, I just want to give him credit. When you create something, you ought to get credit for it. So, this leads to number two, though. You understand the value of time. Now, I want you to notice we said we didn't say you understand the time value of money. That's a different yeah. financial concept. You understand the value of time. When you understand the value of time, you know what you're worth, and then you understand how scarce of a resource time is. Now, and I didn't, you know, the thing about this show, we've been doing this show since 2006. I'm always amazed when things that are going on right now line up into a great teachable mm -hmm. moment. And um, there, there's a billionaire that passed away right. at the beginning of this month. Was well, actually, I guess, last month now because right. we're now officially in the month of October 2019. But T. Boone Pickens, who made a lot of his money in the energy sector, passed away on September 11th of 2019. Here's something he did that was really interesting. He left kind of a post with thoughts on things that he found what made him successful mm -hmm. or things he just wanted to pass down and pay it forward with to the next generation that was to be released right after he passed away. So it was a little forethought in yeah. this. And I, 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 I'm going to actually read you one of the points. We could probably do an entire show on this, Bo. You uh, brought this to me. It was fantastic. But here's, this makes my point. Remember the superpower, financial superhero understands the value of time. So let's read what T. Boone Pickens, who was a billionaire, mm -hmm. what he says about this. He loves going and giving commencement speeches. This is one right. of his things. So that's the context as I'm reading this. Quote, in those speeches, I'd always offer these future leaders a deal. I would trade them my wealth and success, my 68,000 acre ranch and private jet in exchange for their seat in the audience. That way, I told them, I'd get the opportunity to start over, experience every opportunity America has to offer. So here's a guy sitting at the end of his journey. He had accomplished every financial accomplishment you could want. And he recognized the one thing that he would trade it all for was more time. His time. Was exactly. More time to go it back is and a it truly priceless commodity and resource that I think a lot of us take for granted. That's why you constantly, we have a saying around here, don't get busy doing nothing. That's exactly right. It's because you know how valuable your time is. So let's, let's, let's put that. And by the way, this is the part where you're supposed to sing is Robin. I'm not singing. I'm not so, singing. Because because this hit me when we were doing show show, show prep. 525, 600 minutes. Yeah, Reby, that, that's like it. one and done. Reby, he that did That was it. from Rent. It wasn't in tune, though. No, you nailed it. You auto-tune that thing, Reby. <laughs> auto-tune that, and we'll make a fortune. So, But but in reality, what is the average? Because that's one year. Mm -hmm. I, we, I'll, I'll nerd out and tell you. If you do 525,600 minutes... That's one year. It is exactly 365 days. days. Well, we figured out in our own nerdy way, what is the life, how many hours are in a, a human's life? Sure. 
And if you look at a typical life is around 80 years. I know mm-hmm. we took some latitude there. We're optimists though. And we think you're going to live to 80 years right. old. That's right. It's actually 700 Thousand, basically 701,000 hours. So that's how the, the number of hours we get to do the things on this earth we want to do is essentially 701,000 hours. So I now think we need to understand what does that mean? We created a slide so it could give you some knowing how scarce of a resource mm-hmm. this is. So, so Bo, pull this up so we can kind of walk them through this. Look, this, this breaks my heart. Yeah, I mean, so when you think about, uh, you actually have, when you look at time with your spouse, uh, if you assume that you count every hour of every day and you're married for 50 years, you have 438 hour, 438,000 hours that you spend with your significant other. So a little over half your life, That's of right. course, that, and that makes sense. But look at and this is, I'm realizing I'm in the fourth quarter. Heck, I might even be at the, I'm not at the two, two minute warning point. You're getting close but though. I have a sophomore daughter in high school and you only get 157,000 hours with your kids. Before they before they move yeah, out of the house. I mean, if we talk, we we're gonna have to move on from that one because I will start crying yeah. like a baby just thinking about how scarce of a resource it is that you get these little balls of joy and chaos. It's not all joy. There's a lot of chaos in there in the beginning, and then before you know it, they're like doing their own thing. I mean, it's just crazy. So 157,000 hours that, that just blows my mind that that I've already got one that is getting to that point, and then. Bo, tell them about work, because yeah, that's you, an important if, part. If you think about how often you work, I mean, this is where you spend most of the hours and most days. If you were to work 40 hours per week for 40 years, you're actually going to spend 83,200 hours at work. So it makes sense that you probably want to find something that you enjoy doing. Yep. You don't want to waste those 83,000 hours. I thought it was interesting. Daniel found this one for us. He said, look, I did some research. The average human, to be happy, needs two and a half hours a day of kind of free time like or recreation, time relaxing kind of times to just let your do things on your own terms. So he actually extrapolated that out, and that leads to a lifetime of about 73,000 hours of free time if you're only getting the bare minimum right. of, of two and a half hours. But all this, here's the things. We wanted to give you these stats because it really is, the, the, the teachable moment on this is do not waste mm-hmm. this scarce resource. If, if you're looking at your life and you go, I'm just unhappy. Yep. I don't like my job. I don't like where things are going. Guys, take today to be your day of transition to figure out what the next step is, what the vision plan is, so you don't waste any more time because you're not getting more of it. I think the thing that we always say, Brian, and this is financial planning, but also just in like general life planning, you have to understand your why. Well, when you start thinking about time as being your scarcest resource and yep. every moment that passes is a moment that you will not get back, it will influence how you make your consumption decisions, how you make your savings decisions, how you make your wealth building decisions. If you can frame your decision making around that, you become a superhero who really sure. understands the value of time. Yeah, okay. I just thought about my teenage daughter, so it's just, we had to keep going. I'm serious. That will make your, your hair stand up and get all sentimental. So we'll just move on to number three. You have laser focus. By the way, just so y'all know, this was going to be so much cooler. Well, in our heads. We were going to have a picture of me and you in the Batman right. and Robin, the dynamic duo I don't even know if that is Batman and Robin, but we'll run with it. Dynamic duo. We're going to have a picture with lasers coming out of our eyes. And you know what ended up happening? Daniel actually did it. He created it. But he said, you know what? Robin looks so lame with lasers. <laughs> we're going to scratch that and do a different superhero. That's what happened. <laughs> You're just going to keep putting down I'm Robin. I'm going to keep doing that. You should, you should be a good dynamic boy wonder. He keeps calling me the boy wonder, <laughs> Reeby. He keeps calling me that. So let's talk about this. What do we mean by laser focus? This means that, let's think about it. When the market goes down, you get excited because you're not getting sidetracked by all the craziness and the noise of the media. Yeah, and who who does? I mean, think about that. When you see the nightly news telling you that the market is tanking and the Dow lost 600 points and a recession is coming, you're not someone out there freaking out, calling your advisor, logging in to go go to cash. You actually start getting giddy. You yeah, start getting you're excited. Like, I have a 401k contribution that's going in at the end of the month. I hope that I get it on that down day. <laughs> I mean, that, that really is a financial mutant or a financial superhero is that you do have laser focus. And we just talked to somebody. They had a great perspective in the fact that if you look at your grand scheme, you're probably in your 20s. If you compare your lifetime earnings, Mm -hmm. what you earn in your 20s is not going to be with those key years that you make your money with your human capital, meaning your labor. 
But guess what? From your investment capital, investment capital or your financial independence goal of building assets outside of your personal capital, it is your biggest years. Mm -hmm. So you need to always keep in perspective. That's why we're always talking about 88 times over and trying to get you motivated that when you're 20 years of age, your money, $1 can turn to $88. When you're 30 years old, $1 can turn to $23. And then, you know, we're showing you what an incredible opportunity this is, is because it's a scarce resource. Mm -hmm. And we want you to understand that that volatility, because when you're in your 20s, market gets its teeth kicked in. You've got 40 years That's to recover. Right. Get excited about that. It means you're buying more shares mm -hmm. at a lower price. Don't let that down market freak you out into inactivity and having 25% of your money in cash. That same individual that we were talking to, Brian, and he, he's done very, very well, very, very successful. And he said, you know what? The thing I wish I would have done is the second that I graduated college, I wish I wouldn't have wasted any time. I wish that I would have started saving then. I would have started putting money in, started putting money in. And he said, I'd have double what I have now. And he's already reached a level of financial sure. success. We talk about all the time that the most important money you will ever save is the first money you ever save. Yeah, it's true. Best time to start investing was yesterday. Second best time to start investing is now. And if you can get that right in the early years, early on, you don't have to work as hard later in life. And, and outstanding. I mean, it was great. A lot of teachable moments in that mm -hmm. conversation today. The other thing on laser focus is you're immune to the scare tactics. I know yeah. I've already alluded to this, but I just want to put a little more attention is that when you are immune to all the distractions of the financial media, because realize they're paying you not for making your wallet bigger or healthier. They're actually paying you for your eyeballs and your ears because they're trying to sell advertising. You'll know the variables that are actually important. And it's not the advertiser's bottom line. It's making sure you understand age, your savings and investments, and then, and then just being consistent yep. no matter what. You just drive through it. There's Days of Thunder reference. Nice. You see how I pulled that in? And then everything else is just noise. And then last thing, we kind of alluded to this, but let's put it to words, is that you understand how important saving 20 to 25% and mm -hmm. doing it as soon as you possibly can can be, that gives you that laser focus to get addicted to being an empire builder versus being a consumer that only thinks about how you can spend the paychecks That's that are right. coming in. You're trying to think about it in terms of how can I get my assets to work for me? I'm going to take a little bit of today for a great tomorrow. It's that whole concept of deferred gratification. Yeah, I think the laser focus on that 20-25% is so important because we see all the time folks who will start out and they say, you know what, my employer matches dollar for dollar in the first 3% or 50 cents on the dollar for the first six. And so they start their first job and they do that because yep. they're not going to walk away from the free money. But then they get busy and life happens and social commitments happen and work, and they don't ever remember to go back and increase that number. Yep. The superhero is the one who are laser focused on that. And even if you start now at 5% or 10% or 15%, you are laser focused on not just staying consistent in saving, but getting better as you go along to get to that 20 to 25% number. That's true. I mean, because it is a pile on factor. Because if you start saving in your 20s, each dollar you do in your 20s is going to start working for you. That's right. Then you're going to start making more money in your 30s, but you're going to love how well it looked in your 20s with mm -hmm. your money working for you. You're going to save even more. That's right. Then by your, hit your 40s. So that all that money was made in your 20s and 30s by investing. And then your 40s, you, get, you look around and you go, wait a minute, I've got this great base level of assets. Let's get rid of this uh -huh. debt. And that's when you start paying down the debt, but you never sacrifice the army of dollar bills working. Guys, this is why you're a financial mutant or a financial superhero is you get it. You That's understand exactly right. what the next step is to be successful. So that leads to point four. You stretch your dollars further than anyone else. Yeah, you understand that the normal consumer out there can just go out and buy something. They can yep. just go out and purchase something, but you don't do that. You do a little more research. It's, you go a little bit deeper. You understand how to maximize exactly what each one of your dollars is doing for you. Well, I think this is actually one of those fundamental skill sets, Bo, that everybody I've met, I'll give you the, the, I'll give you the compliment that this is definitely you. Because I've known you since you were pretty young, you know. I'll give you, and then I, I'm since getting, I was actually a boy wonder, I'm getting you were a boy wonder. So, and I'm getting old enough that when I look back, and when you're trying to figure out, am I? You know, when you're a kid, when you have your pretend time, and you watch all these superhero TV shows and cartoons, you're like, am I a superhero? <laughs> how do I? You know, you, what's how, my superpower? I don't know if I'm a superhero. So I'm telling you, this is one of those moments in your financial life if you're trying to figure out if you're a financial superhero. The first thing that you're going to realize is does your money really does go further than anybody else? I mean, I have told you guys, y'all have heard me make jokes. I had perfected in high school the $7 date <laughs> night. Now, I mean, look, you laugh. 
It still worked. Braun had dates. Um, obviously, a seven dollar date married night. man with a family. I mean, so it, it had to have it, it worked. And then you know, I always had coupons. I just even in college, people knew that I was even though I came didn't come for money. You don't come for yep. money. I was just good with money. Right. And you tell me that wasn't the same oh, for you. Oh, yeah. You know, it's so funny. I think when I was young, it was always that I was just tightwad. You know, I was just super cheapskate. That's what it was. But it really wasn't that. It was just I knew how to maximize my resources. And I think as we got older and as we advanced, those same people who used to ask you questions when you're younger, they still are asking you questions because they recognize yeah. it is a unique skill set that you possess. Well, and I also think this is where, if you want to know the truth, I'm going to give you all some real stuff here that freaks people out when they reach their 40s and 50s where I'm at is you can take two couples that make the exact same incomes and then fast forward 20 years mm -hmm. and one of them will have almost a seven figure or maybe they do have a seven figure mm -hmm. portfolio and then the other one is still scraping by. Yep. And you're like, what happened here? The, the, the opportunity was exactly the same. The and what you'll find is, is that one was just better with their resources. Yep. So let's kind of get into what this is. The first is focus on the big savings. <laughs> Yeah, uh, this this one, are you, you know, uh, no, go ahead, go ahead. This one makes me think about, um, you know, we were listening to that talk uh, a couple weeks ago at the conference we went to, and the guy mm -hmm. was talking, he was talking about how uh, I'm so mad at people telling you that if you just avoid buying Starbucks, yep. then you're going to be wealthy. No, that's it's that's true. not cutting. Yeah, it's great if you want to cut three dollars out, but there are big savings that you can look at. Where you can actually go save some real money, not just cutting out the little expenses in your day to day life. Well, and that's what the, the big thing is. We wrote focus on the big savings, and I can tell you a perfect one I did. I got my homeowners and pro and automobile insurance renewal, mm -hmm. and I immediately write my insurance broker, and I'm like, what's going on here? I was like, there, there has to be a better deal because this this is getting ridiculous. Right. What's amazing, on the spot, they write me back, and miraculously, my risk profile has changed. Oh. I'm like, whoa, my risk profile has changed, and now my premium is $900 a year cheaper. And I was like, okay, that's great that we're going to save $900, but is this is this carrier, are they offering better rates to new, and sh new clients, mm -hmm. or should we go shop this with others? So she then goes out and shops it. There was another six, on top of the $900, there was another $600 in savings. So I saved $1,500 just by sending an email to my insurance broker. So it was two emails total, saved you $1,500, right? And that's a big, I mean, you think about it, $1,500. Now, I know you're not going to get away with that every year, but sure. probably every three years, yep. you have to keep your ungrateful service providers like your insurance companies exactly right. honest with you so that they're not treating new clients much better than they're treating existing mm -hmm. clients. And there's a lot of things, your utilities, your insurance providers, and those things can add up to some decent sums. We're not talking about skipping lattes here. We're talking about saving thousands of dollars. Same thing in knowing what you own and what you're buying. If you're buying and paying for permanent insurance versus term insurance, what's the real reason that you're buying it? If you're buying permanent or whole life insurance instead of term insurance and term insurance would fit the bill, you're probably paying something like 10 times too much for that amount of insurance coverage. Those are easy ways to trim some fat and get some more dollars in your back pocket. Yeah, so just understand, and look, there's a place for permanent insurance sometimes, but a lot of times for the majority of people out there, if you're just replacing income, term insurance is going to exactly be your right. friend. And that leads to, now this one probably is a little new, more nuanced. I will tell you, this is old habits, old tightwad habits, they're dying slowly, but I still keep a few of them. And I do have, and I will tell you, this is something that as I'm getting older, I'm realizing not all of this is a good use of my time. Sure. But I feel like I at least have to share these resources. So those of you who are in the complete tight wide station where you're, you're saving, 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 and getting that army of dollar bills, you'll know that you're wired the same way. You're a financial mutant. You're a financial superhero. But I do think as you get in your 40s and 50s, you start having success. It's, you have to reevaluate that whole time commitment. Is it, is it a good use of your time? It's back to whole superhero moment number two or three. But here it is. The triple, I call this the shopping ninja skills. The triple tax advantage, the tri triple shopping advantage. Look, I got the HSAs mixed up in there. The triple shopping advantage. The first one, I won't give you a website. I don't know who runs this website, but it's a good one. Cashback monitor. If you've ever wondered... Should I buy through You Promises shopping portal? Should I prop um, through Ebates, mm -hmm. which is now Rakuten? Rakuten. 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 Did I say that right, more? Probably not. Rich, no, I say that right? You did, you did not. Do it. It's okay. They have commercials no, making fun of their no, name. No, I'm Robin. I probably got it. I probably nailed it. <laughs> or should you go through your credit card shopping portals? If you go to cashbackmonitor.com, they have no idea we're giving them this plug, and I'm not getting any kickbacks. We're horrible at that type of affiliate links, but just know that we're giving them because I love that they have a, a tab 
for cashback. If you want to know which portal to go to for the best cashback web, cash website, go there. If you want to know travel miles, because mm -hmm. you're using the credit cards that you travel miles, credit card points, they got all of your things yep. sorted out. It's going to have them all in columns where you can figure out which shopping portal is going to save you the most money. Maximize that. So that's step one of our okay. three-pronged system. Step two is maximize those coupon and promo codes. See, this this is actually a lesson I learned from Brian Preston when I was uh, just a boy wonder. <laughs> he told me, he said, well <laughs> he said, if there's a box on there for promo code or coupon code, it's there for a reason. <laughs> That's what he used to always drill into my head. So I always assume if I'm ever there, I got to go search, see if I can find me a coupon code, find me a promo code, because it's not there just for the, being there. So you can go to Retail Me Not or Google. Mm -hmm. I, you know, if all else fails, just type it in on Google, <laughs> and you know, and then you maybe can find a promo code. And then lastly, I put on here that the, the, the third rung of our three three rung system is know which credit card to buy with. That's right. Um, or maybe debit card. I'll give them some credit if you're not a credit card person, you use debit card. But some give you cash back, some give you gas, some give you extra points for food, and some give you extra points for travel. It's it's amazing. You know, you think about stuff that costs $100, $150, $200. Just doing this little strategy right here can save you, what, two, three, four, five, six percent on those purchases? For sure. Those small amounts of savings over a lifetime, just that become habit, can be material. It does allow you to stretch your dollars further than your peers. It can, it can definitely be a few thousand dollars a year. I, I know that sounds crazy, but it is. But but here's a little wisdom, just getting older, so you don't waste time and effort. I have found instead of trying to track down 16 credit cards so I maximize every point that I can get in right. rewards, it's probably better to have two to three credit cards mm -hmm. and just have general, like I have a cashback card that gives me 2% back on everything. Right. I like that. And then I have a credit card that's pretty good at most other things. Like it gives me extra money for meals, extra money for travel, and extra money for gas. You know, and that covers a lot of your key points. Yep. And that way you don't have to get into this crazy game of tracking credit card points. Yep. I do the same thing with the coupon and promo codes. I try the first two or three. I used to sit there and I'd try about three different pages of coupon codes to see if any of them hit. Didn't happen. So you got to understand what's worth it, what's not worth it. And then I, Daniel would be upset if we didn't share this next thing, because I think this shows if you have a financial superpower and aptitude for this as well, is that you know you potentially are a financial superhero and the fact that you know which month of the year, you get the best deal on certain products. So hit them with the knowledge, Bo. So yeah, so if you are looking at buying a TV, uh, after Christmas to February generally tends to be the best time to buy a TV. Uh, up to the Super Bowl. Super, Super Bowl is kind of the key point to pay attention That's to. That's right, and I think the reason is that all the TVs that didn't sell for Christmas are now on sale, so you can generally get a pretty good deal. Uh, if you want to buy either refrigerators or mattresses, you want to buy those sometime around April to May. They go on sale around May. Uh, and the new models come out in the summer, so they're usually trying to get rid of them in the springtime. And, and I would be remiss. I told Daniel, I was like, go find out if that's a real thing. He wants you to know that there's Maytag Day, which I, see, is in May. See, I didn't even read it. Yeah. I, didn't even, I didn't even read it because I was like, that, Daniel made I that I called up. Daniel into mom's. I was like, I was like is this is a real thing. He says, nope, that's what kind of led to the refrigerator season changing <laughs> in April and May was Maytag because they're one of the original ones. So. You heard it from Daniel, it has to be right. As if Andrew and Daniel said, and then, it has to be um, true. You know, and then keep going, Bill. Yeah, if you want to buy appliances, you want to look at September to December. These are things like washing machines, dishwashers, microwaves, uh, because new models are coming out and appliances are going on sale for Christmas. And then the last, if you want to buy an automobile, December or late December generally tends to be uh, the best time. According to True Car, you can save about 8.3% on a car if you buy buy it on New Year's Eve due to quarterly or annual sales quotas trying to be met. And we've done some shows on, on car purchases. Here's the thing about this, because maybe you need a car and it's not the month of December. If you will just pay attention to month end, quarter end, you know, those are ideal times because the truth of the matter with most car dealerships is that they have this thing, and I figured this out when I was in public accounting. We worked with a lot of car dealerships. Most people don't realize that cars, when you go to deal with deal dealerships, they get what's called holdback, meaning that the manufacturer, based upon their volume and the sales incentives at the time, the more volume they sell in that quarter or that month or that year, they're trying to reach quotas or numbers so they get a bigger portion back to them. So that's why if you can hit them right at the end of those sections or periods, mm -hmm. they're more inclined to give you a deal because sometimes they'll even, I, I know I had a Toyota Highlander that I bought for my wife back in the mid 2000s. There is no way they should have sold me that car for what they did because we bought the car, drove it for six years, she got rear-ended, 
we got paid by the insurance company and we only lost five thousand dollars on the transaction because we got the car so cheap and i know it's because we bought it at the very end of a quarter and they were just trying to unload that thing so they can meet, meet a sales goal with the with the holdbacks of the manufacturers so number five this is an important one because you are watching a financial show or listening to a financial show Number five on your skill sets to being a financial superhero is that you're a lifelong learner. Yeah, this one is, is so huge. And, and this is one I think that we see the most with our clients. Even the, the guy that we were talking today has been wildly successful, very successful in, the, in the, his career world, yet he is still trying to learn different things, yeah. different strategies, different ide- ideas, different ways to optimize. And he's so hungry for it. He listens to podcasts, reads books, reads articles. I think if you have that sort of mindset, it's amazing how much that can bleed through and impact your overall financial picture. Well, and this is one, it's just like when I tell people to read How to Make Friends and Influence People. Mm -hmm. I'm like, not only will this help you in business and financial, but it'll also help you in relationship. I think being a lifetime learner, it's going to help you at the job because you always want somebody who has a curiosity towards life. It's going to help you in relationships because you're interesting. Let's face it. We're all interesting to our spouse or the person we're dating. The more, as long as you're not know it all, but as long as you can find a unique or interesting way to share stuff. Why do you look at me when he said I didn't, that? I, didn't, I was looking he's, at you. He says, as long as you're Robin. not a know it all, you're Robin. Yeah, I didn't. Right. I wasn't. It, it wasn't a negative thing. And then I think it helps you find your passions at retirement. You know, we had Fritz from Retirement Manifesto yep. on where we did the Ten Commandments of Retirement Absolutely. and preparing for it because he's kind of charted his course. And there is two different things he mentioned in that that Ten Commandments of reti- preparing for retirement. And it was like knowing your passions, knowing your hobbies, and then planning ahead and accordingly. That's being a lifetime learner. Exactly You're actually right. moving forward, uh, you know, to make sure you have something to do after you retire. Yep. And that leads to because we all look up. We had a client, a listener slash client, who came by, and this blew my mind. He's only in his mid thirties. Uh-huh. Started listening to the show in two thousand six, and now he's like a beast. And the way he's described to me by our associate that works with him is, yeah, he's a serial entrepreneur. He's got a bunch of different businesses. Just keep starting. And I was like, you know what? The, what is a serial entrepreneur? It's somebody who has a curiosity, coming up with new ideas, and then they starting businesses, finding solutions. That's lifetime mm-hmm. learning. If you think about things like that, and then let's face it, this is the self serving, but it's the truth. You guys are listening to a financial podcast. Mm-hmm. You're listening to a podcast, watching us on YouTube. Now, how many of your relatives, how many of your friends think you are completely crazy that you listen to shows like this? And I'm telling you, we all feel like we're mutants. We feel like we're, we're kind of freaks or weirdos that we watch stuff like this. But I'm telling you, it's going to pay dividends. If you will just stay the course, learn and constantly know what's impacting you it will make a tremendous difference in your financial life. So it can help you in all those different ways. But what did we miss? And kind of go through the five superpowers. So I was going to say there are five superpowers we think if you want to spot a financial superhero, if you just want to know if you are a a financial superhero, uh, you're a master of disguise. You really are the millionaire or soon-to-be millionaire next door. You understand the value of time, where you should place your time, where you should not place your time. You have laser focus on the things that are important, the things that matter, and the things that move you towards your ultimate goals. You have the ability to stretch your dollars farther than your peers, and you're a lifelong learner. You are committed to continually uh, increasing your knowledge base and expanding the knowledge you have on how you approach making financial decisions. So as you are on that path towards improvement, you're probably, you listen to this, you're entertained, but you also learn a few nuggets. That's what people say. Even on shows that I knew the answers, you guys always embed a little bit of, of, of gold nugget knowledge there that's going to help me be better with my money. And that's what we like hearing that Absolutely. stuff. But you're, a lot of you, it's just like that client that was just a listener that is now an entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur. You know, you pro- you might be coming and you're learning and then you're like, that sounds very Southern, by the way. You, might, coming, you <laughs> might be coming and, and then you're doing some learning But too. You're, you're learning concepts. And the thing is, you're going to say, Wow. I have reached, because that is the abundant cycle. We want you to come. It's all completely free. Yep. Learn, apply, grow. And then you go reach this level of success. When you reach that point, you go, man, this is getting complicated. I've got a big enough enterprise that I'm worried about running in the ditch or making a yep. mistake. That's when I'm hoping you will say, I need to bring in some professional help. I want somebody who can be my co-pilot, look over my shoulder, and you'll remember the team at Abound Wealth. That's, That's right. the biggest reason that we love. This was a passion project. 
but it's evolved into where we want to keep paying it forward with great advice. Yep. You're Batman, and uh, we can maybe come in and be your Robin. <laughs> you see how I just put a neat bow on that? Uh, hey, every every uh, Tuesday, we do a live stream at 4 4. Every other Tuesday, we do a live stream. Uh, we're going to, for those of you out there listening on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, we are about to stop press, we're going to press stop recording, and we're going to answer some Q&A. We're going to do some live questions to answer. If you hadn't had a chance to check out our live stream, come check that out. Be, be a part of that. Make sure you subscribe. Uh, on YouTube. Make sure you go out to the website. Check out our blog that we're now doing. Uh, make sure you give us your email address so we can stay connected and in touch with you. Bob, I felt like there's been an evolution on this show. No, you, I'm not embracing it. I no, still don't no, like you it. You came in. You came in. You were complaining about being the boy wonder. You come out. I feel like we still are the dynamic duo. You yeah. kind of, it's like you know that you're, I'm your Batman. You're my Robin. Yeah. It all works out. Yeah. It works. It, 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 we leave in a good place. Very uh, Seinfeld-esque. So, yeah. I'm your host, Brian Preston, Mr. Bo Hansen, not even making jokes about it. And um, just thank you for letting us do this. Money Guy team out.